Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. So finally, our Volk webinar has started. And today's Volk webinar is very appropriately titled. It's all about the view. So we will be learning a lot about vitreo retinal procedures and some tips and techniques on how to achieve the best visualization during some of these most delicate procedures. So as we wait for some more participants to join us over here, um, I think this would be a good time for me to quickly go through our ground rules. So if any of the audience has trouble hearing me or our guest, Dr. Nagpal today, please feel free to let us know in the answer of the chat box below, and we will make sure that our technical difficulties are solved right away. And also when you have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to put them in as you have those questions into the chat box. Throughout the webinar, we will be taking periodic breaks and we will be picking out our audience questions and answering them. So looking at the participant number here and it's, I think we can wait for a couple more minutes to have some more people join us. And let me tell you all, I looked at the content and I'm very really excited for today. And uh, before we start- Xavier, hello everyone. Hello, Dr. Nagpal. So um, I would like to give a short introduction about our guest today. Uh, as I said, um, we're here with the webinar series and we're going to be delving into video retinal procedures. Dr. Nagpal is a senior consultant, retina and uh, vitreous services from Ahmedabad, India. He is a very, very uh, passionate teacher and uh, professor and has presented many of his case studies all around the world and has done more than 20 live surgical instructional videos before. And uh, we are very, very excited to have you here with us, Dr. Nagpal. Uh, with this, I'm handing it over to you. Would you like to say something before we start? Well, uh, wonderful to see everyone. It's a very good good evening to all of you from here, and I'm sure it's a good morning in other part of the world where you are. Uh, so I'm very happy to be on this platform, uh, which Woke has organized. Uh, as you already said, I'm very passionate about uh, teaching, and especially where surgeries are concerned, and the viewing platforms, and and how to get uh, a good view while doing surgery, because. Uh, when Maitri asked me about the title for this, I said, it's all about the view. And, and that's what I tell all my fellows and everyone that if you can see things better, you can operate better. So, so viewing is the most important part of uh, a vitreo retinal surgery. You know, you, you can have all kinds of techniques, instruments, whatever. But if you don't have a good view at any point during the surgery, you can't carry out that maneuver uh, to the best of your satisfaction and and you would not do justice to uh, what needs to be done. So it's all about the view. And, and that's something that I've always been, um, uh, you know, passionate about. And, and I think we'll, we'll uh, touch some of these aspects. Uh, I think Maitri has some questions for me, which, which we'll take up. And then I'll show you some examples of cases where we can look at uh, how we get good views during the surgery, whether it's for a wide field view or for, uh, different medias which come in, in the interface or if it's a macular surgery. So so some different examples, we look at them and see how best you can get a good view through them. So I'm looking forward to this. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagpal. And uh, I think Dr. Nagpal gave us all a very good uh, brief summary of the agenda for today's webinar. So um, the, I would describe it as the first half me and Dr. Nagpal are going to have like a small chat about some of the techniques and uh, tips that he can give us for video retinal surgeries. And then later on, he's going to be presenting some of his case studies to us and showing some very beautiful and interesting videos. So before we go in, I do want to introduce myself. My name is Maitri Pulera and I handle uh, technical marketing here at Volk and my background is in vision science. And so you can see that is why I've been like all grinning and very excited to get this webinar started. So Dr. Nagpal, with that, I think let's start. But before we do that, I do see that we have a lot of our participants coming in. And I, I always love to start webinars off with this one question, where is everybody from? So momentarily, guys, a poll is going to be up on your screen. And the question is, what is your favorite work lens and where are you from? And so while people answer this question, Dr. Nagpal, 
may i ask you what is your favorite whole cleanse to start off with well for me uh, I've, i've grown with these lenses and uh, a 20d is is i think for a retina surgeon a 20d is is a fantastic tool for everything that uh, takes care of diagnostics of course if you go to surgicals things keep evolving changing and we'll talk about that but my favorite lens if you say 20d kind of takes care of Uh, almost everything that you need as a gross diagnostic platform and then you can expand on it and um uh, i think for me it goes way back uh, my father was a vitreoretinal surgeon and even when i just joined uh, mbbs i was not into ophthalmic residency in my free time i used to go to the hospital and he'd already given me a 20d and 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 i had started on seeing patients so so for me it, it goes way back way back uh, when i started using this so this is probably my favorite lens very nice uh, that must have been a really nice experience to you know get exposure into um, you know how the retina Absolutely. looks and works even before you started so let's Absolutely. look at some of the answers here of the poll and see what some of the favorite lenses of our audiences are and where they mostly are oh actually <laughs> dr <laughs> nagpal this is um, most of our audience 20d1 so they also love the 20d just like you and that's closely followed right. by the 90d and i am sure that's on the slit lamp fundoscopy side sure sure and, absolutely yeah yeah and just uh, before we begin just a small uh, brief pattern of where we're seeing guests from we're seeing them from all over we have guests from asia south america north america india and europe so we have quite a lot of audience today so let's not keep them waiting and let's get started um and i would like to remind all of you if you have questions as we speak through the webinar please feel free to put them in the question and answer box below and we'll get to them at regular intervals throughout our webinar so dr nagpal so you told us that your favorite lens is the 20d so now yes. that you graduated from the 20d like you mentioned right so what is the one thing that you wish you knew as a trainee or a student that you know now right that could help all of those watching so what is the one advice you would give to yourself when you were a trainee or a student yeah so i mean we talked about the favorite lens and we end up as retina specialist uh, the lens that we use the most is 20d and and while using it uh, we forget that what posture we are keeping and and we are constantly bending down uh our necks our spine our lower back when we are examining patients when we are operating buckling surgeries when we are doing uh, binocular lasers uh, rop screenings i mean almost everything that you do uh you are constantly putting a strain to your neck and back and i don't think anybody told us uh, through all those early years you know we were just told oh spend hours and hours just screening the retina drawing the charts uh finding the holes breaks lattices uh everything and and you would spend and that time uh you're young and your body can hold up and, and 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 down the line i think it takes a toll and i think everybody today i would like to advise everyone that you should take care of your posture do a lot of neck exercises back exercises uh to make sure that you're compensating uh for all that toll which is taken place so so this is something very important that all retina specialists should know that uh save your neck and spine because if that's not not healthy you're not going to be uh happy uh, through the later part of your life when it takes its toll because nothing happens at the beginning it happens uh down the line many many years back and so i would tell everyone to be very careful uh if you wish to take up retina you will have to do a lot of uh examinations with 20d and and then uh, take care of your neck and back <laughs> <laughs> that is good uh, that's a very yeah. good advice and especially in a lockdown situation like this it is important to start moving and you know keep exercising that's good advice thank Absolutely. you so much dr nagpal and now moving from the 20d and a little bit of a diagnostic more basic part now into our technique part right so we're really hitting that with your retinal uh, space now so for wide field visualization in uh, vr techniques and surgeries what do you especially look for in a lens the white field is is the mainstay for vr surgeries today um, i think when i started in 96 97 uh, 
uh, the VR surge is that time the wide field lenses were just coming in and we used to use the, the flat lenses, the prism lenses and all those to see wide field views, but they had a lot of limitations and, and, and uh, I don't think we were happy with different interfaces using those lenses and, and the visualization was not good at all. And early 2000, 2001, 2002, something like that, I remember having been exposed to uh, one of the wide field lenses. My first lens was an AVI lens. AVI was the first uh, lens which had come in uh, with the wide field and eventually moved on to uh, the work platform. But uh, I remember having, once I saw a view through that, I don't think I ever went back to the, the flat lenses, the plain lenses, which we were using, the irrigating lenses. Uh, you know, now nobody knows about them, but uh, we, we've operated with irrigating lenses in the past. And uh, once you have a view of what you see with wide field lenses, with what we use today, uh, I don't think you can go back. So it's extremely important. And only if you use wide field can you do justice to your surgery. You can have a, a whole view of the fundus. You're operating in one area, but you also need to see what's happening in, in another area. You might be pulling at something which is inadvertent, which you don't see. So uh, we want to see a very good wide field lens, which has clear view, uh, less distortion, uh, as wide as possible, but of course also allows a bit of magnification as much as possible. So uh, a good wide field lens with uh, least amount of distortion reflexes, uh, and if you use your microscope well with it to focus and to zoom in to areas, uh, if you combine all this, it's, it's, it's I think the best way to look at the retina as of today, uh, that, that the choices are, yes. Okay, and so Dr. Nagpal, just to clarify, when you say a wide field lens, you are talking about the contact retinal lens systems, right? Well, wide field is for both, contact, non-contact. I personally use contact. I've grown up with contact and I, I am addicted to them. So I, I don't like non-contact ones, but uh, a lot of surgeons, most of them, in fact, uh, they like uh, non-contact uh, as well. So uh, both of them give you wide field. I personally feel that contact gives you a more crisper view. Uh, mm -hmm. Just like if you would look at even a diagnostic, if you look at a, a contact lens to view the, the, the retina, even in, in an outdoor patient versus a 90D, there's a difference. Uh, uh, of course, it's not practical to use them for simple diagnostics. But for surgery, uh, I think to get that crisp clarity, and I'm also passionate about making good videos surgically, everything. And I can I can sense that it's uh, it, gives, it gives me an edge with the contact-based systems as the view is crisp. Uh, the peripheral distortion becomes a little less uh, at times. So uh, on a personal front, I, I'm, I'm for a contact lens. Yes. Awesome. And uh, so, Doctor, are there any particular applications or techniques in which this wide field becomes <coughs> for us? Oh, as I said, every single VR surgery requires them. Today, we cannot distinguish that, oh, this is a case and I have to bring out my... Uh, uh, wide field lens uh, today for this surgery. I think when these, this technology, this whole visualization came in, uh, people used to segregate them that, oh, this is for a giant air, this is for a, a peripheral, this thing or that thing, and this is for macula. But today, I think uh, I'm using the wide field for every single surgery. I mean, I, I don't think I have an inventory list that, that with this case, use this or that. I don't think it works like that. These are standard lenses which are there for every surgery. So I would always have a wide field lens, which would be mostly an HRX with or a, uh, the, the regular SSV, which you, uh, you know uh, you have, or uh, the for a macula, I have the Chalam lens, and all these in an SSV platform. So, so this is something that I would. Uh, these two lenses will be my mainstay for every surgery. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So then, doctor, that kind of leads me to my next question, right? I think which you touched upon in this particular question, but when performing macular procedures, right? So which kind of an instrument would you choose and why? Again, like same lens application technique kind of a breakdown. Yeah, so I kind of already talked about it that I keep the Chalam lens of yours, Plano, which is fantastic view for a good magnification. If you want to do an epiretinal membrane peel or uh, uh, ILM peel, uh, the view you get with that lens is fantastic. The stereopsis, the crispness. So uh, I would always keep that on hand for the macular component of any surgery. So if I have a macular hole or an ERM, or, uh, it will always be there. Uh, uh, for that part of the maneuver, I will switch it on to that lens. The rest of it would be with the wide field. If I'm doing the PVD creation, the 
the regular vitreous uh, removal, all that will be with white field. And then I'll switch to the chalum lens uh, once I do the peel. All right. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And uh, so also across when you're using uh, various interfaces too, like when you're doing air fluid exchange, I think that these same lenses would hold up too. Oh, yeah, the white field lens works for all interfaces. So, in fact, even in, in my presentation, I'll show you a few videos related to that. But the beauty of these lenses is that uh, unlike the previous irrigating lenses, the flat lenses, I remember that when we used to use, there used to be a separate lens for a, a fakic eye, a separate lens for a pseudo mm -hmm. eye, a separate for an ophakic. And then when you change the interface, you had to change to another adapter lens to compensate and then have a look which was not as good but with the white field the beauty is that uh, you're working under saline uh, uh, fluid and then at some point you switch uh, on to uh, air and uh, as soon as you switch on to air all you do have to do is slightly refocus with the microscope and then you get a crisp view instantly so uh, nothing much changes once you're on a white field uh, even with the smaller pupil, uh, different interfaces, uh, it just continues. Awesome. Very nice. So thank you so much for that clarification, Dr. So now I'm uh, switching up gears a little bit here and, uh, you know, taking our topic towards the global scenario today. So given how the COVID pandemic is affecting us, how has it affected your practice and your operations? Well, uh, we are in a lockdown since almost uh, we'll be complete two months uh, in, in a week or so. So uh, we've been in a lockdown of sorts uh, and only handling emergencies or urgent requirements of patients. Uh, for the first month, we were just going a couple of days a week uh, and pooling in a few patients uh, for that. While now, uh, we've just since a week started uh, seeing a few patients every day, but uh, mostly urgent or emergencies and uh, surgeries like retinal detachments or trauma. Uh, those are the kind of cases that we are doing at the moment. And we are hoping that in the next coming weeks, uh, things may open up uh, a bit. But yes, it's extremely, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic is affected globally. I'm sure everybody is affected and we are affected the same way. Yep. And uh, that's actually um, true for most of our situations. And I'm also sure that our audiences, uh, as I've mentioned, we have them like from all over the place, like from Africa, from Asia, and from everywhere that I can see here, they're just, and I'm sure almost all of them would also agree with us when we say that um, the pandemic definitely affected how we work. And one other question that a lot of people asked us, uh, Dr. Nagpal, when we put the registration for the webinar in, was they asked us uh, how could they ensure safety and cleaning of their equipment so before we move on to your case studies, uh, I just wanted to spend some time really quickly to take people through those procedures, if that is okay. And so the one thing that uh, we did want to let people know is uh, about our single Absolutely. lenses line. And a lot of people have been asking about this and are moving towards this and the single use lenses since they're just a one-time use and they come pre-packaged in sterilized uh, Tyvek pouches. So although um, all surgical instruments are usually sterilized and everything is followed to a T, nowadays we are seeing a trend where people do not want to take a risk and are using single lens, uh, single use lenses instead. And so this depends on their application again. We do have them in our BIO lenses, right? So this is especially seen in cases where doctors deal with uh, premature babies like ROP cases. So when they do screening, they're choosing to use disposable 2080s or even laser procedures, uh, outpatient procedures, people are choosing this because it's easier. One, because they have lesser staff in their offices to do the sterilization for them. So it's easy and ready for them to use. They can just pick it out, start using it. And also for vitrectomy, we do offer a line of single use lenses. Right. But moving on from sure. that, I do know that our audience as well as you have a lot of our reusable lenses in place. Right. Right. So our non-contact uh, lenses like the 90D as well as the 20D, they can be washed with soap and uh, rinsed off under running water. So that is good enough because they don't really touch any tissues. 
But however, when we're talking about our Ganyo lenses, we're talking yes. about our laser lenses, right? So those are very, very Absolutely. critical. And so that is where disinfection, we need to take a lot of care. And for that, we do suggest first clean your lens carefully. And once done, we suggest dunking it in a disinfection solution. Now, there are many ways you can make the solution. Here I have a couple of uh, options up on the screen. You can use household bleach one part and nine parts of water and soak your lens in it for about 25 minutes. Or else there's also Cydex and uh, glutaraldehyde or Reser. And other list of approved cleaning agents are available on our website, wolf.com. And I would like to stress that only use the approved ones because your lenses are very carefully crafted and we would want to take care of that design. So once the solution is made, make sure that you position the lens on its side and let it soak for a good 20 to 25 minutes. And once the soaking time is done, remove it out and thoroughly rinse the lens in a new bowl of water, rinse it off, and then again rinse it under water, running water, then dry it with a soft cotton cloth that has low lint, right? And always make sure that your lenses are moisture free before you store them away for the day. So I hope that uh, helps our audience as well as uh, Dr. Nagpal, you can tell your colleagues too, because this is a question we often get asked in Absolutely. a lot of great shows. So um, yes. I hope that helps. And also audiences, if you have any questions, feel free to ask us or also email us and we'll get back to you ASAP. So, Absolutely, very useful information, yeah. All right. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Nagpal. And actually questions reminds me, we haven't really taken any audience questions in a while. So let's answer some questions then. Sure. Yeah. All right, uh, the first question, uh, Dr. Nagpal, that's directed directly at you. What viewing system does Dr. Nagpal use? Yeah, so I use the the non the contact based ones with the inverter attached to my microscope. So there's an inverter which inverts the reinverts the image so that I can see straight with any of these wide field ones. The image gets inverted, and you need an inverter. So uh, is the same inverter which is also used with biomes or non contact systems, uh, uh, which works for uh, this as well. And then the lenses contact, which is uh, uh, the wide field lenses, which is uh, the HRX lenses, which are there, which is what I use. And for a macula, the Chalum lens. So, so this is what I would use typically in my uh, surgical cases. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. And Dr. Nagpal, um, I, uh, so here uh, a user asks, I have a problem with XY movement while using an inverter. How to resolve that? Uh, the, maybe the alignment needs to be checked because as such, uh, the XY is on the microscope and the inverter is attached to the, in between the optics of the, uh, between the inverter and the microscope optics. So XY technically should not change uh, uh, the view. Uh, it just inverts it. Uh, so if at all it's by doing the XY, you're facing problems. Uh, you need to figure out with the microscope uh, some alignment or, or the way that it's attaching uh, may not be correct uh, because these inverters come specific to microscope makes. So, so if it's a Zeiss, they will invert, when you take an inverter, they will always ask you, are you using a Zeiss or are you using a Leica? And there are different interfaces. And if suppose there is a mismatch or something, uh, there may be a little difference in the alignment. That, that's what I can think of. Uh, otherwise, it should not make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Nagpal. I hope that answers your question. And that is also a very important factor when we help our, um, our call-ins, our customers, we always ask them, what is the viewing system that you have so that we can provide the right resources for them? Okay. Absolutely. Moving on to the next question. So this is again a little COVID related. Dr. Nagpal, would autoclavable lenses be more preferred than non-autoclavable in post-COVID era? Yes, I think... Uh... Sterilization now becomes, uh, I mean, it's post-COVID, everything is about how do you go from one patient to the other and, and, and in between, what do you do? And, and these questions are going to come up. I don't think we have a full answer yet, but yes, autoclavable is one way of sterilizing it. You can do gas sterilization. So whatever practically, or you need to have a larger inventory uh, if you have more cases lined up because you can't 
do them right away uh, and and uh, switch gears you know you you have three or four of them and then you uh, use them then end of the day you sterilize them either on autoclave or on gas uh, you know something like that needs to be done yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i do agree and uh... Actually, Dr. Nagpal, I do have a question of my own. How do you expect, like, when everything starts opening back up, do you expect the number of cases to ramp up? And how long do you think that ramp is going to last us? Uh, you, by cases, you mean the, the surgical cases? Yes. Or the COVID? Surgical yeah. cases, sorry. So, surgical cases. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So, uh, yeah, I think because, see, everybody has been in a lockdown and nobody is uh, really looking at routine cases like macular cases. I think everybody... Who probably has operated in this time is only emergencies, detachments, or you know things trauma or things like that. So there's a lot of other surgical indications which are still, uh, I guess, patients are waiting. And and once it opens up, uh, there will be a gradual to a, a significant increase over the next few months. Uh, God forbids nothing new happens and lockdown doesn't increase or or nothing. Uh, so if it's open, things are going to increase, and we'll have to be extremely uh, cautious about how we how we increase our numbers, uh, especially in view of sterilizations and other things and to safeguard ourselves and our staff. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagpal. That does answer my question. Um, so, one second. So let's go get our next question. So Dr. Nagpal, so here we have a question that says, does the HR excellence need to be held by an assistant? Uh, no, with the SSV version, uh, I don't use it, but some people uh, do have assistance holding it. In my presentation, I'll show you a small clip of uh, what I do with them. And uh, it stays, I just use uh, uh, one of my fingers from the left hand, which is free, while when I'm holding the fiber optic to just kind of steady it uh, uh, whenever I move uh, with the patient's eye. But otherwise, I don't have an assistant holding it. And I'll show you uh, during the presentation. All right, perfect. Uh, so, Dr. Nagpal, we do have another question also that's asking about what technique we should use to keep it um, upright and prevent tilt. But it looks like you're going to be touching upon your technique later on in the presentation, right? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll touch upon that. And, and of course, there is a handle available uh, in case uh, somebody wants an assistant to hold. There, is, mm -hmm. there are a few handles which are available where the uh, assistant can just hold clearly uh, 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 I mean, hold it for you. Only thing is you have to make sure that the assistant is seeing exactly the same thing you are seeing. Uh, they need to know that because when they hold it, it needs to be steady and give you the right image because, uh, and that's something that I like to be independent with. And, and hence I've kind of trained myself to just hold it myself rather than shout at the assistant that, oh, the view is not right and blame it. Got it. All right. Got it. And uh, so doctor, so the next question we have is, how do you shift from a non-contact viewing system to a contact type viewing system as a young VR surgeon? And I know that we discussed this briefly in the beginning of this webinar. So can you elaborate on that just a little bit to help uh, the person who asked this question? Well, uh, I've always started with a non with a contact, so I've kind of grown with it, and it's it's something that uh, I'm very comfortable with. But uh, I've had a lot of people come into my OS when uh, somebody likes a video and they say, "How do you do it?" And then I want to come and see what. And they come in and they see, and uh, they go back and uh, order a contact lens, and then they call me that we are having this problem and that problem because I like, can't hold it steady or we are not getting the same view and all that. So uh, these things do crop up, but I think like we get so tuned to a certain way of working that uh, you need to unlearn. Uh, it takes a few cases. I think it's not that you need a, a lot. If you are a good, if you're already doing surgeries with a non-contact and you're comfortable with that view, uh, uh, first of all, no, no dire need to shift to it. But if you are inclined to shift, you, you can just shift to a contact and uh, consciously try to do a, uh, three, four, five cases, and and by the end of it, you, I don't think it will be very different uh, as long as you know how to hold it or have an assistant hold it, and and you may feel that the view is crisper or better, and 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 you may acknowledge uh, that at the end of it. Right, perfect. I hope that answers your question. And uh, so, Dr. Nagpal, um, let's. I think let's. It's time to move on to the next section. Audiences, do keep your questions coming. We will answer them again later in the webinar. 
So with this, Dr. Nagpal, I know everybody's excited to see your case studies. I know I am. So I want to hand the control over to you so that you can share your studies with us. Sure. So you can uh, take off your screen uh, uh, then I'll share my screen here. All right. There you go. Okay, do you have my screen now? Yes, I see it. And I hope our audiences do too. If you don't, please do let us know okay, so, questions and we'll help you out. Sure. So, so I guess, uh, as I introduced earlier, that uh, pituitary surgery is about the view. And, and, and that's something that uh, we'll be talking about as we go through these, uh, these cases right now. Uh, yeah, okay. So visualization is the key uh, and, and you need to see inside uh, the eye and the retina. For retina surgeons, it's most important to see, uh, to get the best possible view uh, of once you're starting to work inside. So just to show you that uh, how the viscoelastic is put and then uh, we put one of these, either the mini cord XL or the HRX, we have a variety of them. So for, uh, as I said, you need a larger inventory when you're doing going from one case to the other and then you kind of, so this is how I hold it. You know, I have uh, the right is the cutter, the left is the fiber optic. And if you see the one of my fingers, the index fingers, which is holding the fiber optic is also slightly pressing on the uh, lens, which kind of uh, constantly gives me a control. So even during the surgery, when I uh, have to move the eye a bit, uh, the whole complex moves together to a large extent, the, the fiber optic light as well as a gentle. And, and in between, if I'm just working on the central plane, uh, I just take off the finger. It does, it's not required. It's uh, the, the slight nudging of the finger is required only when you move the eye and you feel that. Uh, because most important for visualization is that your microscope optics, your lens, and the patient's macula or the retina needs to be exactly in the same line. Uh, so if any of them is, is out of the line, uh, the view is going to be distorted or, or less than perfect. Uh, so you need to make sure that everything is aligned in a straight line. Uh, one of the other things which I would also like people to uh, know is that when you have the patient lie down, make sure that the eyeball uh, uh, is in a place which is straight towards the microscope. Uh, it's, it should not be that the eyeball is, uh, after the block is looking down or up, or the chin is uh, down or up, because if, if the eye is not flat on a flat plane, as well as in the same axis, you will face problems during surgery to readjust. So make sure that these variables are, are taken care of before uh, you go in. And once these are, uh, you put these lenses on, and then this is how I start my surgery. The, uh, you, get, you start getting a view. This is uh, the, the view where I'm trying to get the focus right, everything. Uh, this is how I would do in a normal surgery that first starts getting the central focus right, see the disc, macula, and, and be comfortable. Uh, then you can start looking at the periphery. Like here, you can see uh, as we go to the periphery and use the microscope XY to go there, you see a lasered uh, tear there. Uh, after that, uh, this is a macula hole case. So uh, we injected a dye and then uh, uh, I'm going to do the peel. So till now, I have a wide field lens. And now I shift to a Chalam lens just for the peel, uh, which is uh, there. So this is typically how I would uh, use shift. This is a macular case. So I would have, I, I did the rest of the things with the white peel lens and then uh, shifted to a Chalam to do uh, this part of the procedure where I'm peeling a membrane or an ILM or, uh, or whatever at this stage. So this is how I would uh, go in. But for people who may find it difficult or at the beginning where you want the variable of the lens being steady uh, constant, you could use a handle which an assistant is holding for you and it works very well uh, uh, with, with, the, with the permanent assistants that are there with you. You know, people, they learn fast and, and if they know what, uh, how you want to view it, they, they can view through the microscope and give you the, an excellent view. So then you don't have to bother about uh, this part at all. So let me take you through a few surgical cases now where uh, this is a view of a retinal detachment with multiple tears. And this is the view you would get uh, using one of these wide field lenses, uh, which I use the contact ones. And uh, 
the central part as well as the peripheral part there's hardly uh, any distortion that comes in your way uh, you can uh, what i do is i like to work under slightly higher magnification so uh, even though these uh, wide field lenses don't allow magnification of their own to a large extent uh, because they are giving you a very wide view i use the microscope uh, to zoom in uh, to areas of interest so so uh, where you want the whole view you could reduce the magnification of the microscope and get a whole view and where you want to work uh, to in an area of interest just zoom in and and see things as closely as possible with a very good stereopsis uh, because that would allow you to uh, be at least dramatic now here as you said i've done a vitrectomy uh, uh, the, there are some folded edges of the tears i'm using a, a blunt uh, like a atraumatic instrument we call the massager uh, uh, just to unroll those edges so that uh, uh, we don't want them rolled over at the end of surgery uh, and they are flat before we do the laser uh, so so here i've magnified and you can see this is an extreme periphery of the of the retina and you are seeing it uh, quite clearly there was a vessel bridging past so i have just diathermized it in anticipation that sometime during the surgery uh, that vessel may get cut and they may it may bleed so i have just diathermized it also and and then i am doing the laser to uh, all the edges of the of the breaks at the end so and and this is under air now and and you don't see uh, the same lens is there throughout the surgery i don't change anything except uh, uh, focusing in that so the beauty of these lenses is that no matter what media you're working on air fluid partial air fluid pfcl silicon uh, all you need to do is just uh, refocus uh, you know the same focal plane may not work for all uh, you may need to focus down or up and 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 within a few seconds uh, you are there now this is during a surgery i'm shifting to air and and all you can see is reflex is changing as i go and 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 clear up near the disc uh but uh, and then i'm endo i'm doing endo drainage from a break in the periphery so uh, i don't need to shift the lens or anything like we used to do with the irrigating lenses uh everything just gets uh, seen clearly just tap on your foot pedal uh for the focus a little bit down and up and and and, and you are there so these are more examples of uh, how you see the periphery in detached cases again a large tear uh, which you see here uh we are doing vitrectomy clearing up uh, all the vitreous so and as i go to the tear i want to be sure that i don't inadvertently cut the retina so i'm i've really magnified it with the microscope this is the same wide field lens which uh, uh which which can give you a view which is minified and then uh, use your microscope and get an extremely magnified view and uh, here uh, i I'm, i'm also using a chandelier light uh, another way to enhance your view is to use a chandelier light then you have a hands free on your your left hand is free so i'm using an indenter on my left hand uh, again no assistant is required for this because the light is coming from the chandelier and i'm indenting the periphery and going to the peripheral part to remove the the vitreous from those regions so so this is another thing that you can add you use a wide field lens you could put a chandelier for cases you require uh, a lot of peripheral work on especially with Uh, detachments of pvrs where you want to uh, work in the periphery uh, so you could uh, use this so you can see that i alternatively shift my hand now the right hand is indenting uh, and the left has the cutter uh, and uh, so you you do it for the 360 degrees of the of the uh, maneuver uh, that's there at this stage so we are finishing the the dissection here after that you can see that i'm uh, Uh, draining from one of the break and the retina is flattened again the magnification that you see we are under air now that uh, you've seen and then the laser is finished uh, and do a 360 because there are multiple breaks here and we finish that uh, case this is another example to give you a wide field view this is a giant tear which is uh, everted as you can see the whole flappy tear uh, you're seeing it through a pseudo fake eye so you see the rim of the the, the pseudo fake uh, component of the uh, lens and you can zoom in and start seeing uh, uh, the whole fundus as a whole uh, so first aim is to see as a whole remove the vitreous assess the situation uh, is is what you would do and then you would zoom into areas of interest uh, to make sure that you do uh, good justice to each clock hour uh, uh, of the same so in giant tears the typical idea is to clear the vitreous make it freely mobile 
uh, remove the peripheral edge, uh, which is redundant. Uh, and, and once the vitreous is gone, you can, you can go to the next step. So uh, here, the next step is to unfold it. Uh, and for that, we need perfluorocarbons. Uh, so perfluorocarbons, uh, uh, liquids are the most essential component of giant tears. And uh, actually, we need to thank Stanley Chang for both uh, perfluorocarbon, also for wide field uh, lens viewing systems. Uh, he was instrumental in developing the first RV system, uh, the contact-based systems. Uh, for wide field viewing. And, and he also was instrumental for perfluorocarbon. So when we talk of giant tears, I think uh, these two things have changed the way we manage them. And, and it's important that we acknowledge uh, where all that happened. And so you can see that after unfolding uh, it with perfluorocarbon, I'm still trying to do a little bit of checking in the periphery because once the retina is flat, it allows you to do a better dissection. Uh, and, and now we are doing laser to the peripheral uh, aspect of the giant tear. Uh, which you see has unfolded uh, to the whole edges. Three or four rows of lasers are done. And then the crucial part is an air fluid exchange here. So here, some people like to go straight to silicon oil. They do a, a, a exchange directly from perfluorocarbon to oil. I prefer to go to air first. So when you go to air first, your aim is to dry the peripheral edges uh, very well uh, so that there's no slippage of the tear. And you can see that through all this maneuver, whether we were on PFCL, we were on fluid, uh, we switched to air and now going to silicon oil. Uh, the same lens is working for all the situations. Uh, uh, I, we don't change it at all through the whole procedure. Uh, all you do is keep on uh, refocusing to the best of your uh, view that you're getting at your level to do that. So these were for some wide field uh, procedures. And, uh, and, and this is for macular hole and a pucker a few such cases where uh, the ability to see uh, what we do with macular cases. So this is a pre and a post-op of a classic OCT for a macular hole for residents and all who, 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 who know that this is how a macular hole uh, would look like in post repair. And macular hole surgery has two or three important steps. The first being PVD induction, uh, the which is uh, hyaloid is always uh, attached and and this is staining with the triamcinolone. You see classic halos of triamcinolone staining, which help you see the plane of the vitreous. And then with the uh, vacuum, you aspirate and remove that. And this is the first most important step of uh, any macular hole surgery uh, today. So PVD induction uh, is, is the most important. And after that is ILM peeling. So once you have done that, so this is done under a Chalam lens. That one was done... PVD was done under the regular wide field uh, HRX lens that uh, we, we use. So, so as you can see that you get a much better crisper stereoscopic view with the Chalam lens for a peel uh, like this uh, rather than with a wide field because there you'll compromise your stereopsis uh, and the magnification. While for a peel, you want to see everything very clearly. Now, in our technique of macular hole, after the peel, we use this uh, instrument called the massager that we've developed. It's, it's like a 25 gauge miniature version of an external indenter. It's a smooth bodied instrument. What we do is we slightly massage the 360 degrees of the edges so that it gets a bit uh, relaxed. And after that, do an air fluid exchange, again, shift back to the wide field lens here uh, to do the exchange. And you can see the view is very clear. And as we do the exchange, the hole has almost become pinpoint and uh, is, is almost uh, not seen anymore. So, so by doing the PVD creation, then doing the ILM peeling, and then a bit of that massaging, uh, you relax the whole uh, uh, area, which was circumferential traction, which was there on the hole. And as you go to air and do the exchange, the hole becomes uh, a pinpoint in nature. And after this, you put gas. So, so this is typically how uh, we would do the macular hole surgeries. Some of some people would also use the ILM flap, which they removed, they would stuff it in that central hole. Uh, and there are a lot of different techniques uh, which different people use for, for, for uh, these holes. Mm -hmm. This is a case of an epiretinal membrane. Uh, again, uh, uh, where one of the commonest procedures that one does today in uh, vitreoretinal surgeries. So your first aim is to remove the vitreous. Uh, and once you've done that, you shift to your Chalam lens uh, and you get a view like this, which is extremely well stereoscopic. You get the whole view reflex of the membrane and use the forceps and, and gradually remove it. So 
this maneuver is always done in a circumferential manner never uh, a tangential kind of a thing never try to pull it towards you uh, because you don't know which side what type of adhesion is there and you may create an inadvertent tear or a break always move circumferentially uh, and keep watching what's happening on the underlying retina uh, as as you peel it off and and this is how it would uh, come off the main membrane and once the membrane is gone uh we we also like to peel the the ilm from there uh, so for that you need a stain uh, the brilliant blue is what we use and you can see that after the stain uh, underneath the peeled membrane there is an ilm which which is gradually being uh, pulled off at this stage with the forceps again so this is how and and the retina is a little boggy because uh, the the epiretinal membrane does cause some stagnation of uh, things on on the retina which can make it a bit boggy and uh, uh, and and this you are seeing that the peeling is slightly different at times as compared to macular hole surgeries uh, where that retina is not as pathologic uh, the surrounding retina while in epiretinal membranes uh, depending on the chronicity it can have a bit of a bogginess interesting so um dr nagpal uh, i do have a couple of questions which i think will be relevant over here before okay, we move sure. to take the sure. all right sure. so gaurav asks how often do you require to indent while doing vitrectomy with these wide field lenses uh very rarely actually uh, but it varies from case to case and the view you get uh, so there may be a case which is but a very well dilated pupil and everything and and when you put a wide field lens it just lets you see to the aura right away and then there may be a case with a phimos the uh, uh, capsular rexis or a border of a lens or 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 a very small pupil or you know there could be something which is not or the a cornea may not be good uh, or something so if i have any of those cases and and i am not seeing an area i would indent or uh, but okay. otherwise uh, most cases i don't need indentation you can see most of the uh, areas right up to the periphery to do justice to them all right got it yeah, yeah um so doctor which um viscoelastic do you use for your procedures usually i mean the typical uh, uh viscoelastic that uh, you know the regular one with i mean the uh, methyl cellulose is it methyl cellulose yeah yeah got it regular, oh. yeah, yeah all right all right i hope that answers that question and how do we obtain the macular hole massager so doctor did you say that you developed it uh, so can you answer this question for our audience please yeah so we developed it with uh, uh, locally with the epsilon uh, company here and they have it uh, with them on their i can maybe share with you their contact later and oh. you could share with them yeah yeah we we'll have no finance i have no finance i have no financial interest in it but it's available there <laughs> <laughs> sure sure yeah so we'll help you all out and uh, we can send sure. you the Yeah. All right, perfect. So, uh, sorry for that little break. I think we can continue yeah. with uh, case studies. Sure. So, uh, another example of one of the macular surgeries. Another important area uh, uh, indication is the vitreo macular traction. Again, so macular hole, epiretinal membranes, and vitreo macular tractions are uh, some of the more important macular surgeries, uh, common ones that you see. So. the vitreo macular traction is something like this on the oct where uh, the macula is pulled up the fovea is pulled up and uh, each of these three condition is treated differently macular hole has its own nuances uh, epiretinal membrane has its own and vitreo macular traction although is like a precursor to a macular hole kind of a situation type 1a or b macular hole but here one needs to be very careful that when we stain the hyaloid uh, we don't just pull at it straight away because here what can happen is that the fovea is very thin because of the traction and when you pull uh, pull at this you make deroof the fovea uh, it may just pull off the fovea and you're worried about it so here what i do is stain and carefully keep on dissecting the hyaloid which is stained uh, and and kind of separate the central hyaloid attachment from the peripheral one and you can see that uh, whole of the central hyaloid is now looking uh, stained separately so here i shift to a chalum lens and now you can see the interface much better because with the wide field you got a gross view but you it's difficult to uh, look at the planes of the hyaloid and the retina and you may make a mistake there but here you can see that it's very well defined that uh, the stain part of the hyaloid 
now is almost like a small parchment like uh, uh, which is segregated from all its periphery and only the central part remains and i'm i, I would be worried to pull at it uh, because if i pull at it it may deroof so what i'm doing is i'm peeling the ilm uh, and 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 with the ilm it it kind of moves off from that area but otherwise if i feel that even with the ilm it is uh, adherent i would just leave it i would trim it with the cutter and leave that part rather than pull it so there's a difference to how we treat vitreous macular traction as compared to macular hole where in macular hole we will just pull off this hyaloid while yeah. here you want to be extremely careful that you don't deroof the central part and and this is how we do so this is possible to do if you have a very good view uh, of the planes uh, of the hyaloid ilm the, the everything uh, together and, and that is achieved with these uh, you know, the chalum lenses uh, for this part of the procedure so this is for uh, a vitreous macular traction that we would do so this would be like a pre or a post op of a case like a vitreous macular traction with grade 1a or b hole and oct would look like this one more case of a macula uh, this is a case of a sub ilm hemorrhage uh, sometimes so there is a hemorrhage which occurs right over the fovea and in the sub ilm plane and then it, over a period of time it gets uh, loses its hemoglobin and becomes a bit whitish in nature so uh, this needs to be removed uh, surgically and so the first step is to do the hyaloid peel which we did with trimsin alone and and uh, after that because it's sub ilm i kind of stain it with the uh, Uh, die and and then we put the macular lens the chalum lens and you can get a view which is uh, extremely uh, well stereoscopically seen uh, and you can see the stained ilm moving off uh, and and opening up uh, the the area where the blood is actually there because otherwise you can't aspirate it uh, so now that the ilm is gone uh, from that area after that we will uh, use vacuum to remove uh, this uh, blood which is kind of deposited here so you can see the cutter is now moving over the uh, uh, that with the aspiration you could also use an extrusion needle for this part of the maneuver based on what your preferences are but uh, with the cutters which are now so the ports have gone so close to the shaft i, I pretty much multitask them for uh, most of these uses so gradually we we aspirate uh, some of this so as we are aspirating you can see that the blood starts clearing off from there so these are uh, various macular uh, viewing of the surgery indications where we use the chalum lens uh, mm-hmm. because one lot of people also do the whole procedure in the wide field as well they said that why shift to but personally i feel that your view is best uh, if you if you are able to magnify it stereoscopically to this extent where you can decipher the planes very well you are less likely to make a mistake uh, on the planes if you are seeing it so magnified while if you are seeing through a wide field view you may be a very good surgeon and you may with experience uh, get away with it but uh, uh, you may still be better off with uh, having uh, a magnified view for these kind of procedures one 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 small procedure i wanted to share is that we talk of vitrectomies and and for detachment operations there's also a buckling surgery which has always been there and that uh, buckling has over the period of time uh, uh, the procedures have gone down because vitrectomy has improved so much and and techniques and other way, the visualization has been so good with vitrectomy that uh, over a period of time people have gone off buckling but buckling still has indications younger patients where you don't want to remove the vitreous you don't want to give them cataracts uh, there are certain indications where buckling works well so we have uh, devised a, a way that we use the same lenses uh, which we use for vitrectomy which is the wide field ssv lenses and then we put a chandelier light uh, and then we do buckling without doing vitrectomy so i i'll just show you uh, a procedure uh, of, of that so so this is basically a chandelier light that you see and the view that you get inside and i'll show you a video of uh, one such procedure so this is a, a buckling surgery in a myopic eye you can see and uh, we've put a chandelier light and there is uh, no vitrectomy ports except the chandelier light and we've put the this the woke contact lens on top so you get uh, a classic vitrectomy view and i'm doing a cryo at the moment to the break uh, after that uh, externally we look uh, we uh, localize the break which i have cryoed 
uh, and put the plomb and then do drainage uh, I, we do a needle drainage uh, in the infra uh, temporal area which we've localized and you can see the this uh, fluid is coming out and once it's done you look inside again and the retina is flat with the with the buckle effect uh, which will be uh, visible now so you can do the whole procedure of buckling without doing vitrectomy but having the advantage of vitrectomy viewing system uh, with the chandelier so so this is something that uh, we worked on and developed and, and a lot of people now use it for buckling surgery so so it's another advantage to these lenses uh, that one could move on to so, um, Dr. Nagpal, again, I saw another uh, question over here, which I think fits in quite well to some of the detachments that we have been talking about. So, uh, one doctor here is asking, how do I remove PFCL if it goes behind the retina during giant tear management? Okay. So, PFCL, first of all, uh, will go behind the retina only if there is traction, uh, existing traction, uh, or if your injection uh, injection spray has gone directly uh, under the retina, where the, the flap is not there, where the retina is not there. So uh, in that situation, what needs to be done is that if suppose uh, there is no traction and, and the jet of the fluid has gone back, then what you need to do is start injecting PFCL uh, on, on the disc and start unfolding the retina. And as it keeps on unfolding, uh, the subretinal PFCL will come out uh, eventually from the sides as you keep on filling it to the brim. Uh, but mind you, the vitreous needs to be out before this. So make sure that you first do a good vitrectomy uh, because if there's still vitreous there, then you can't keep on injecting PFCL to the brim. Uh, so make sure that you have a, a totally vitreous-free eye when you do this. And then if you inject uh, PFCL, it will, it will gradually push it out uh, eventually. And suppose you have a giant tear with some traction, with some PVR, then you need to release that. You need to first make sure if there's a membrane or, or any traction or a contraction, you may need to do a retinectomy. So if, if any of that is situation is there, you need to do first also to do that and then uh, put in PFCL on the disc and, and I'm sure you will, uh, it will stay well on the retina after that. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Nagpal. I hope that answers your question. And uh, the next question is, do you perform ILM peeling in all VMT cases until and unless there is a chance of complications due to IMLP, I, ILM peel? I totally agree. I don't peel ILM for all VMT cases. I peel for all macular hole cases. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't peel it for uh, VMT cases and I would only peel it in uh, the indication that I showed you that uh, if uh, the attachment is such that it's, it's attached to the fovea and is not coming out easily, I would not go after it and I would uh, use the ILM to remove it because uh, end of the day, the ILM is the most uh, anterior part of the retina and uh, any attachment going there is, is going from the ILM. So, so most times I've seen that if I remove the ILM, uh, that VMT comes off along with it. So I would only use the ILM removal for this. If suppose that uh, adhesion was not strong and, and it came off while I was doing the regular PVD uh, I would not bother with trying to remove the ILM after that. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nagpal. Again, I hope that answers your question. Um, so one more question before I think we can move on, Dr. Nagpal. What was the lens that uh, doctor uses for ILM peeling? It's the Chalum lens, SSV, uh, one which I uh, showed you. That's the one I use. That's my most preferred lens that uh, works on these cases. It's a plano lens, flat lens, we call it. And it it's ideally suited to get the best view of the macula for uh, an ILM, ERM, or any anything that you need to have a very good view of the macula for. Okay. So doctor, uh, this question asks, which lens do you use for scleral buckling? I thought you said wide field, but can you confirm that for us, please? The same lens, which uh, the HRX uh, or the SSV wide field, whatever, uh, whichever is there, one of these two lenses I use for that. Same oh. which I use for vitrectomy, the same is used for that. Oh, perfect. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Nakpal. So let's move on. Yeah, so this is, uh, I think, the last one I just wanted to show you uh, a, a complicated case of. Uh... Okay, so this is a complicated case. I thought I'll just put one of these that bad PVR case, a myopic case, which has been operated earlier and now has 
oil which is gone in the subretinal space so inferiorly you see a, a totally contracted retina with oil which is gone behind so so here i put in a bit of pfcl on the posterior pole to stabilize it uh, and then inferiorly uh, i'm cutting the retina after diathermizing to liberate the subretinal silicon oil uh, so uh, this is more to show you the interfaces that you know these lenses work through all kinds of interfaces whether it's uh, saline you put in pfcl you put in oil you put in uh, you will keep seeing uh, everywhere clearly you just have to refocus so here i've uh, liberated that oil and after that uh now assessing the areas of the traction which we are gradually removing from all sides uh and and you need to do diathermy before you cut because otherwise it may bleed and then gradually once i know that the traction is relieved you treat it like a giant tear uh you you do a good you pfcl fill you do 360 barrage of laser uh, and then uh, uh, put oil at the end of it so this is just one of those complex cases but just to give you an idea of a view that Uh, the whole procedure is done with the same uh, lens i don't change it now here i don't go to a chalam or anything else because i don't need a, a <clears throat> macular view unless i have to peel uh, i'll just continue with with one standard lens through the whole surgery uh, through all interfaces uh, whether it be saline oil gas air whatever uh, through that mm mm-hmm. perfect got it So these were some of the cases assortment which I thought would do uh, uh, some explanation in our brief time to uh, mm-hmm. talk about wide field lenses and the chalam lenses and how I achieved the view uh, in in these situations so any any further questions are welcome Sure thank you so much Dr Nakul those were first up I have to say those were some very very beautiful videos very well taken and your explanation like the right it was amazing thank you so much for thank you. showing us all of those um So as you suggested I think it would be a good idea if we move on to the rest of the questions. Sure. So um one doctor here asks how do you manage in progressive IOL implanted cases don't you find difficulties in viewing? Yes that's a very good question actually uh, I think when these multifocal lenses came in and uh, 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 uh people started talking about the view issues which were coming in but mind you you put in the wide field lens uh multifocal lenses have no problems with it at all uh when you face a problem is when you put the chalam lens or any flat lens and you're on the macula yes you will uh the view is not as this you will you will feel a graded focal plane because of uh the way these uh, lenses are made the, so so with the chalam lens you may feel it with the macula lens you may feel uh the multifocal lenses are not giving you a constant uh this focal plane as you move your forceps to peel you may feel that uh, uh, there's a slight defocus happening with the rings of the lens which come in and that's a problem we don't know how to solve uh, you just have to train yourself to move your uh, eye alongside but if you shift to the wide field lens to do uh, all the rest of your surgery uh, wide field lens uh, has no obstruction uh, for some reason there optics are such that they just bypass uh, all these rings and you don't feel you don't even know that the patient has a multifocal lens so mm-hmm. sometimes what happens is that in these uh, where i'm facing a lot of problems of uh, focusing then i switch to the wide field lens or use the equatorial lens of uh, the voc which which uh, you know they have an equatorial lens also which uh, originally i used to use but then you know you don't want so much inventory all the time so i just use the uh, wide field but equatorial lens gives you a reasonable magnification uh, uh, uh of that area and then you can zoom in with your microscope and and then peel it so so that would uh, bypass some of this uh, would be my suggestion i see okay yeah. thank you dr nakpal and uh, is that the mini quad you're talking about yeah mini quad excel the equatorial one uh, you know oh. they have the the wide field one they have equatorial one and a macula one So mm-hmm. the equatorial one uh, would uh, would bypass the the rings of the multifocal lens. I see. Got yeah. it. Thank you Dr. Nath. And moving on to the next question. So how to prevent slippage due to viscoelastic and when there is bleeding from the limbus due to, uh, during periotomy? Yes, yeah, so uh, viscoelastics uh, uh, you have to refill 2 3 times in a half an hour period you know when you feel that the view has started or if you feel some blood has trickled in you just take it off and uh, 
uh, have your assistant wash uh, a saline spray on it and then re-put the viscoelastic. So uh, what the good part of the, the small gauge surgeries, this, the 25 gauge and all these is that we use trocar based surgeries. And nowadays the conjunctival bleeding is, is we hardly face it. We used to face it a lot when we were doing 20 gauge. Uh, and that time we used to use a lot of diathermy to make sure that there's no bleeder uh, which causes it. So that problem is now very less, uh, is not huge. But suppose we are doing a combined surgery and you know you have some scleral, uh, corneal scleral wound where you've taken off conjunctiva is bleeding. Uh, best is that before you start your witches procedure, make sure you've diathermized uh, any bleeder on the surface. Or even in the buckling surgery I showed you where we have removed conjunctiva and we are putting these lenses, there we face sometimes uh, bleeding. But I, I try to make sure that before I start my surgery, after conjunctival removal, I, I would I would treat uh, all bleeders with external diathermy because otherwise, as you rightly said, the, the, the blood sometimes keeps coming into the view and, and obstructs it. Thank you, Dr. Nagpal. And uh, so moving on to our next question, how to prevent fogging of lens like droplets accumulation while using uh, the mini quad XL? So the equatorial lens that we were talking about. So frankly, I I don't face it. Uh, I've, I've seen people having issues with it. And, and sometimes when I've operated at some other centers uh, uh, for life surgery, for teaching, and I've gone to some other hospital and I've, I've faced their fogging, uh, but somehow in my theaters, uh, whatever works, the, the temperature or whatever, I've never faced them. So, so I, I really don't know what uh, the issue is, but... What people say is that because of the, if there's a gap in the, when the patient is breathing and, and the way you've draped it around the eye, uh, if there's a gap and that patient's breathing comes, uh, constantly comes, it can fog. So make sure that that is taped well. Uh, the, the passage between the patient's nose and what's, uh, where your lens is in the eye, that needs to be uh, totally well blocked. It should not be uh, open. And um, I, I think your OR should have reasonably good uh, cooling. Uh, if it's too hot and maybe if the humidity is high, uh, it can cause. So those are things one has to be careful about. I Got think. it. Yeah. All right. And uh, Dr. Nagpal, I would also like to add uh, to that. Also to some doctors who have experienced fogging before, we do recommend that um, you can use like an anti-fog spray just on the surface of okay. the lens, right? Once it's cleaned and like safe, just put a little bit of uh, approved anti-fogging um, spray on it and uh, you know after the webinar we can contact you and let you know a couple of brand names that we've uh, told before but that also these are, sometimes works. So these are sterile ones available mm -hmm. yeah so um after the webinar like we can give you the specific names and the procedure when and where how much would you be put using on the lens right mm -hmm. okay so then oops okay there so when we drain fluid during buckling surgery and the eye becomes soft, can the ch chandelier light harm the lens? Yes, theoretically, yes. But what you need to do is when you are draining, make sure that uh, uh, when we are pressing uh, the posterior part of the drainage area where we are draining, uh, you keep the pressure high uh, in the eye. And if you feel that the eye had a lot of fluid which has come out and as soon as you relax, uh, there's a lot of hypertony. I would always keep a, a air ready with 30 gauge needle and, and I would be ready to inject it uh, before I release the pressure from the uh, pressure which I'm giving while draining. So that at no point is the eye under is under an intense hypotonic situation, which which apart from chandelier can also cause other problems like bleeding or or uh, choroidal effusions and other things. So, so you have to make a judgment. Sometimes the drainage is not that much and, and, and the hypotony is not that significant and you mm -hmm. can release it and gradually have a look. But sometimes the fluid is too much, which has come out and, and the eye does become uh, soft. So, so I would recommend keep a 30 gauge needle with a 2cc of air uh, uh, ready uh, and instantly just inject it through any, any pars plana area. So to compensate for what has gone out and before you have a look. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagpal. Um, here, this is a more of a equipment question. What is the ideal magnification of the microscope? So what is your sweet spot when you work on the microscope? <laughs> I don't think I look at 
the the number there it's mm-hmm. it's i just think keep on increasing it uh, with the good switch as as i get comfortable on the view and i show what i showed you in the surgical clips is practically how you so you don't have to look at a number you just keep on uh, just you tu- fine tune yourself to zooming and xy uh, make mm-hmm. sure when you're shifting to these if if it's something that is new for you uh make sure your reflexes are well trained that your left right foot switch is of course on a vitrectomy pedal uh and your left one is on a microscope so so your left foot uh, coordination has to be uh done well and and you need to play around with your xy and and zoom and while you are doing surgery uh just comfortably try to zoom into a plane uh and and when you feel oh this is this i'm getting a very good view which is magnified mm-hmm. and and i can see the vitreous attach the retina on the edge of the tear and 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 this is what i want to work in for this area uh, work on it for that much time and then you can rezoom zoom out uh, to look at another area then again zoom in so i wouldn't want to give you a number uh, i don't think i look at a number of that this is ideal uh, start with the highest uh, field uh, so that you get a whole overview you are well focused uh, mm-hmm. your landmarks are well established you know where the disc is macula is where the periphery is uh what are the crucial structures you want to avoid and then start zooming in uh to areas of interest mm-hmm. perfect okay so and just a couple of more questions i think uh, we are running sure. low on time but uh what is your preferred method of sterilization at your um practice well, we do etos to these lenses i i i am not using the autoclavable ones but we earlier had some autoclavable ones also which uh, we were where we used to autoclave them the surgical oh. lenses yeah in fact way past we used to use formalin chambers also uh, now those are not approved so we've stopped yeah. using them okay yeah. so I, yeah all right got it thank you dr nagpal and uh, i think this is going to be our last question for today i do know that right. we are continuously getting questions but we will make sure that we answer them and get back to you later on uh, so saying that um, because we are running low on time we'll have to connect with you all later but the last question for today is uh, dr nagpal in cases of corneal edema how do you adjust do you use a different lens or do you use a different particular maneuver that you have right so cornea is a different ball game altogether the lens you cannot i don't think there's a lens which will bypass it so the lens is the same and the, and probably if a lens bypasses it will be one of these wide field lenses uh, none of the uh, other regular lenses will uh, they will be worse in this situation uh, mm-hmm. because everything every edema gets magnified with uh, those plano lenses so you're better off seeing whatever you see best with these lenses what i would do is during the surgery if if an edema has come up i would remove the epithelium uh, uh, that that really takes care of it so which is what most of us vitreoretinal surgeries uh, happens that sometimes if it's a lengthy surgery or if it's an already inflamed eye uh, a trauma case or many other factors or it, it the edema may come up as uh, in the middle of our surgery or if you have raised pressure too much especially yeah. in diabetic surgeries where we are raising pressure to uh control bleeding uh the corneal edema may come up so best is that to recognize it you come out and see oh this is an edema and you 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 take a a, a bart pack of blade and and just scrape it off uh, and and put viscoelastic and when you view back it's much clearer perfect okay yeah, thank yeah. you so much uh, dr nagpal i would love to keep going but uh, unfortunately <laughs> we're running low on time and i also know that it's evening for you so i don't want to keep you from your dinner um, and also our indian oh, audience and everybody in that hemisphere and uh, so with that um, i really would like to give a small summary of thank you so much for having that chat with us and giving us some of your basic tips and techniques for a broad uh, wide field view versus macula and which cases you would use a chalam lens which is our macular lens versus an hrx or a mini core which are our, some of our wider field lenses and also thank you so much for showing those beautiful wonderful case studies um i looked at your uh, online classes either in like cybersite before and as well as your other social media youtube channel as well as on instagram so guys uh, if any of you did not have a chance to look at those videos dr nagpal is very kind enough to make those like available on his youtube i've seen some of those before too so please go ahead and check them out and uh, thank you so much everybody for being over here with us and uh, if you have any questions feel free to reach out to us at work@work.com
And if you have any other product questions, if they're not technique related, if you have product questions and inquiries, you can head over to volk.com or you can also email us at volk at volk.com. And uh, last but not the least, do make sure to follow us on our social media channels so that you know when our next webinars are coming up and you can be there for sure. And Dr. Nagpal, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. I'm sure everybody learned a lot. I was taking notes as you were speaking on my screen. So thank you so much for being with us here today. Nagpal. Thank you very much for having me over. Enjoyed it. Right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. See you all next time. Stay safe, stay healthy.